The, uh, with Doc's uh, aerial strobe, it was possible to take pictures with very low cloud with very low cloud cover because you could go right underneath the clouds and take the pictures. It had its moment of great glory during the Second World War when they took pictures at Normandy of the Normandy beachhead area the night before the picture was the night before the uh, invasion in order to determine whether uh, there was any enemy troop movement. There wasn't. So it was assumed quite correctly that the uh, secret of the D-Day invasion had been successfully kept. Uh, the early studio strobes were not only very expensive, but they were also very cumbersome. The uh, electronic components needed to make them work were very, very heavy. And so there was a constant effort to downsize the units. And this is a collection of downsized strobes covering a period of, oh, perhaps 35-odd uh, years. Some of them still required being plug-in power, such as the, uh, this one made by Victor. Some of them required had wet batteries that needed, could be recharged. Some of them had dry batteries. But the process of downsizing was relentless. As long ago as 1975, Honeywell came out with something called the Strobinar, which was completely self-contained with four batteries in the top. This particular unit was a presentation unit made and given to Doc uh, on to celebrate the 25th anniversary of their first uh, product of this type. The remarkable thing is the very first strobe unit, studio strobe, cost $400 in 1940. That was an astounding amount of money. Uh, in today's dollars, that would be four or $5,000 at the very least. And it was a great deal of money for what was then an untried product. And it was much more money than most studios could afford. As late as 1960, Doc I remember hearing him express the fact that if we can get strobe units, portable strobe units, down to $100, we might be able to develop a mass market for them. Now, you can go down to a store and pick up a camera of this type. It's called, it's simply a disposable camera. You use it one time to take pictures. It has a, uh, oh, an average price, I suppose, 10 or $11 with a built-in strobe. And you're expected, actually, I suppose they recycle them, but uh, you're expected to use it just one time. Now, virtually any camera you buy will have a built-in electronic flash or strobe. Not all strobes, uh, strobes were strictly for photography. Uh, uh, there's one shelf here, for example, which uh, consists of soap powder, bullets, a golf ball, a tennis racket, and an ordinary propeller. And every one of them had their design affected in some way by high-speed stroboscopes. For example, cavitation is a destructive effect uh, that reduces the efficiency of a propeller. Well, studies of cavitation in a tank by a high-speed stroboscope made it possible to modify the design of the propeller in such a way as to minimize cavitation when it was desirable to do so. Sometimes it's not, it's not necessarily desirable, but in usually it was possible. Uh, golf balls, for the first time they photographed an iron hitting a golf ball at the moment of impact, and golf ball manufacturers were able to, de the center of a golf ball is a liquid material, uh, we're able to determine the fact that uh, maybe we can make our golf balls fly further by in change, increasing the density of the material on the inside. We didn't know that they collapsed so far. Bullets, ballistic studies. Soap powder in cons concerns a manufacturing technique. Uh, there was a, uh, 
an argument between several of the big soap manufacturers in the 1930s concerning the uh, manufacturing process of soap powder. And uh, one of the firms wished Doc uh, and his colleagues to find out, if he could, uh, whether their process, which was visually identical to another process, was in fact not, was, was in fact unique, excuse me. And he succeeded in doing so. Uh, ordinary electric fans, the shape of the blade was changed uh, when they found out that the traditional fan blades were very inefficient. And uh, this gadget right here, I, I call it an entertainment strobe, uh, is, is a type similar that became very popular in discos in the, in the 1960s. Uh, they would light up the dance floor with a, with a stroboscope and mirrors because of the unusual effect. And there's one, uh, one gadget down here. It's a, it's a trifle heavy, but it's called, Doc called them his electronic calling cards. And they just flash. And they go into towers on buildings. And uh, for a number of years, he encouraged building owners. He said, look, he said, I'll give it to you and I'll maintain it. You put it in the building. And he said, then airplanes won't run into your buildings. Well, uh, it was part of a program that he had to get strobes used in unusual locations. Now, uh, air, uh, air, airways, uh, air, airports are immeasurably safer because of the strobe lights on the landing field. In bad weather, pilots can see where the landing field is because of strobe lights. And they're, of course, on airplane wings, on the leading edges of airplanes, strobe lights are mounted. This is a picture, uh, an artistic uh, representation of what, it, what a, a, a research vessel and an underwater camera and strobe setup look like. Uh, and we have right to the here an actual unit of this type. Camera, strobe, and a gadget called a pinger. Now this is kind of interesting because this could be lowered to huge depths, 25, 30,000 feet. It was necessary to position this 10 feet from the ocean floor. How do you do it? Well, the pinger sends a signal down to the floor, which is received on the ship.